all pretty common, the ones that are here, the ones that are online. And we've got a couple of late stragglers that are on the way. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, Sterling title here, which will talk to you about health insurance program, the workman's comp program, and OSHA logs. Sterling Insurance Group. Sterling Insurance. If you have anything that's a question, please don't hesitate to ask. Nothing's a bad question. For those that are sitting here, please grab something so you can eat while you're listening. Um, if you need notes, there's pencils in front of you. Um, with that, so I, I'm Greg again. This is John, my boss from ABC. We have in the back, we've got Scott, um, Julie, Julie, and Brad. Brad. So, uh, and online is, is Dustin, right? That's right. So if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. With that, um, I do want to get a list of everybody's names that are here online, if I could. Is that possible? Yeah. You probably have a log. I'll write them down. So let me start up. Let's see, so we got, uh, is it Melissa, right? From Tri County? Melinda. Melinda? Yep. Melinda McKnight. And what's your phone number, Melinda? Uh, it's 810-732-7740. And then your email address? Uh, that would be Melinda, M-E-L-I-N-D-A, dot tri-county roofing at gmail.com. Okay. All right. And with that, I will turn everything over to uh, Sterling Insurance. Dustin's going to kick us off. Okay. Um, you Dustin, up, Dustin. Okay, Dustin Boss. All right, guys. All right. All right. I'm ready to go, guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, my portion of today's session is to go over some OSHA record keeping compliance updates and introduce a brand new benefit uh, for everybody in the line today for being a part of the ABC chapter there. Uh, free access to a really slick tool called OceanLog.com. Um, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am the founder and creator of Ocean Logs. Of course, I think the software is great. You'll have to uh, be the determiner of that after you hear this presentation. Um, but uh, we built Ocean Logs a few years back, uh, actually back in 2015. Um, to help employers with everything OSHA record keeping related, you fill out one simple form, it creates a PDF of all of your OSHA records. It'll do your workers' comp first report as well. And then all sorts of injury metrics and some really other great features. Um, just as we launched back in 2015, the federal government hit us with some really significant regulation changes, which required many employers to now digitally submit for the first time their OSHA records directly to OSHA for review. Um, it poured the fuel on the fire on the importance and everything OSHA record keeping related. So, right. So we're now at a point we have thousands of employers using the system. We had to become experts in all these new rules. So we learn and we continue to learn everything we possibly can about OSHA record keeping. I'll tell you, I'm a really fun guy to hang out with at a party. I can rap with you and chat with you about everything OSHA record keeping for hours on end, but we, we assume that's not everybody's favorite topic. So today I want to condense this for you uh, in about you know, 20, 25 minutes and give you guys a really simple way to, to help you with this, with this compliance issue. And of course, help you prepare for the compliance deadline, which is right around the corner, which is March 2nd. So my agenda today to help you guys prepare for this, this submission rule, um, we kind of have to go backwards a bit and, and learn who needs to keep OSHA records in the first place. And then that'll allow us to determine uh, who needs to electronically submit. We're going to talk about some changes that uh, happened with the recent election and how we see that have an impact on, on OSHA record keeping, of course, OSHA as a whole. And then what you can do now and how the folks at Sterling can help you uh, with this compliance, uh, this issue. So OSHA record keeping overview. For decades, employers have had to keep track of their OSHA records on various paper forms, right? Why did OSHA put this in place? Well, they wanna see where injuries are happening, what industries are having issues. 
so they can put regulations in place to help support OSHA's mission to keep people safe. The farms, they've changed over the years just a bit, but fundamentally still the same. We have three farms. We have a 301 individual form, a 300 log, and a 300A. 301, for those of you who haven't seen these before, this is the injury and illness incident report. It's one of the first forms OSHA expects an employer to fill out when there is a workplace injury. According to their regulations, they want employers to fill this out within seven calendar days. Um, so the key thing to think, you know, one injury, one incident, one form. That's the 301. Information about the employee, where they were treated. So were they treated at the hospital? Were they treated at the emergency room, an occupational med center? Who was the doctor? And then we get more specific information, like what was the employee doing, you know, at, at the time of the incident, what caused the incident, some more detailed information there. Then we take that information and we put it on the OSHA form 300. Uh, and this is the log of work-related illnesses. This is where we get that terminology, the OSHA log, right? So every line item is one individual incident. So we're tracking the employee's name, their job title, their date of the injury, where, they, where the event occurred, describe the injury or illness. We classify the case. And then we look at days away and job restricted days. And then we look at the type of injury um, that it was. We summarize all that at the bottom on these page totals. We take that information and we put it on our third form, the OSHA form 300A. This is a summary of work-related injuries and illnesses. This is a form that needs to be certified by a company executive and is printed and posted from February to April of every year. So um, employees can view it and see it. That's one of the regulation elements of this that OSHA wants employers to be, employees to be able to review that. And that again, as I mentioned, from February to April of every year. So for those who've been in the line or watching this recording, if you haven't posted your forms yet, good reminder to do that. Um, you're only printing and posting that 300 day. One of the first things an OSHA inspector will ask, um, I've got some friends in, uh, in my OSHA and some friends in OSHA uh, uh, you know, nationally, and the inspectors will tell you how quick and how fast and how clean and how organized your OSHA records are you know, when they may start an investigation really can set a positive tone or a negative tone for an OSHA inspection. But legally, you have to provide them within four hours of request and they can ask for up to five years back. General contractors, right? ABC, we're part of the ABC here. Um, if, you're, if you've done any work for a large uh, general contractor or maybe you request these um, from your subs because, you know, contractors wanna know how safe are the people that are gonna be working for you are for them. Progressive companies have also used this data to better analyze where the injuries are coming from, not just you know try to prevent an expensive workers' comp claim from happening, but if you're able to view these OSHA records and look for patterns, we can prevent something more severe down the line. So that's what OSHA is looking to do, and you as an organization do the exact same thing. So those paper records have been around for a while, but back in 2016, OSHA said, you know what, that's not good enough for all the inspection activity that we do. We only get access to 1% of the data. So they said, hey, we're gonna make a change. And now um, certain employers have to now also digitally submit the data to the federal government. And that deadline, that date is that March 2nd. So we use kind of the analogy, um, just like you file your taxes with the IRS on an annual basis, April 15th, you must submit your injury data with OSHA on an annual basis on March 2nd. If you don't, OSHA can levy a fine, but I think even more importantly, they have grounds to come to a full-blown OSHA comprehensive inspection on your organization and any inspections or fines and stuff they see at that point, they can levy on top of that um, you know, initial fine. So just note uh, um, that is uh, what they can do there. So how, where do we start first? As an organization on the line today, we got to make sure do we have to keep OSHA records in the first place? So this is a good time to re review, am I doing this right? So who must keep records? It's really two criteria. It's based on the number of employees you have. If uh, you had 10 or fewer employees during the preceding calendar year, you're not required to maintain logs during the current year. And this is pretty broad in terms of who you count. It's full-time, part-time, temporary employees, seasonal employees. And how you track it, you look at a slice in time at any point in the preceding calendar year, did you have that many employees employed for you? That's when that triggers. So it's not the number of W-2s that you have, you know, it's every employment law is a little bit different. We just know that. 
The second criteria is a type of industry that you're in. There's some exemptions. I will tell you, all construction trades have to do the OSHA form. So there's not an exemption for any construction trades. It's all based on your NAICS code. The way the NAICS code works is it's a hierarchy um, numbering system. But again, all construction entities um, uh, must, uh, if you have the number of employees, participate and keep track of those OSHA logs. How do you keep track of them? You do it by establishment. So this is one area where there's some confusion uh, when, when employers are looking at setting up their OSHA records, right? Because while we have those three forms, you may have multiple sets based on how your organization is structured. So according to OSHA, an establishment is a single physical location where business is conducted or where services are, are performed. Employers are required to keep track of their logs by establishment, not as a company as a whole. So when we're working with employers, sometimes uh, we'll see that, let's say they have four locations throughout Michigan, like four offices, four branches, however you want to look at it. They're keeping track of their incidents on one set of these 300 and 300 days. And that is wrong. Well, you actually need to complete, uh, organize it by your individual establishment. So it's one of the first things we may help an employer with. The a, a partial exemption I mentioned earlier is based on the company as a whole, not as an individual establishment. So let's say we have six employees at one location, 17 at another, 25 at another, to 60 at another. As a whole, right, I do some simple math, we're 308. We, of course, would have to keep the records for all of our locations, even though one location had less than 10, right? That's why I show the six. You got to make sure uh, you understand where that number comes in. Another example, let's say we have three employees at one location, two at another, two at another, and two at another. Overall, we're under 10. We would not have to keep track of our logs uh, based on that uh, employee mark. Um, we get a lot of questions, right, from construction folks, right? So here's a Q&A right from OSHA site. As a construction company, we may have as many as 30 different job sites during the calendar year. Do I need to complete a separate 300 and 300 form for each? So they say no if you have short-term establishments, right? So somebody, you're working at a site that's less than a year, you do not have to maintain an individual log for that location and uh, keep it uh, lumped together in terms of your short-term establishment so you can lump them all together. If you have a job site that is longer for a year, then you need to keep track of that as an individual um, location. If you have any of those scenarios, we're here to help you with that. But just know we get a lot of those questions, especially working with the contractor folks. If you're currently keeping your logs lumped together as an employer as a whole and you're questioning yourself, hey, maybe I'm not doing this right, um, the folks at Sterling can help you with that. Um, and uh, it's really important because how you're digitally submitting your data is all based on individual establishment. You're not submitting the data as a whole. So if you're unsure, now is a really good time to review that and to get it right. So next we move on to recording incidents. So we talk about having these forms. Well, how confident are you in the quality of the data that you're reporting? You know, you may be sending this data to a, a general contractor, they're bidding, they're looking at your results. You want to make sure we're, we're not under-reporting, but we also want to make sure we're not over-reporting as well. Um, I always mention this, OSHA records are designed to collect, compile, and analyze uniform injury data nationwide. Workers' comp is uh, designed to provide medical coverage and compensation for workers who are injured. But they're not the same. So just because it's workers' comp doesn't mean it's OSHA recordable, and just because it's OSHA recordable doesn't mean it's workers' comp. There's a ton of overlap, but if you're determining factor of whether you put it on the OSHA log as workers' comp, you're not doing it the way OSHA wants you to do it. So just keep that in mind. You have to work through a record-keeping flowchart. Um, did the employee experience an injury or illness? Fairly obvious question. Did the injury or illness was it work-related? Is the injury a new case? We don't want to keep track of the same thing over and over. It's the same aggravation of a case. Where we get most of our questions is on does the injury or illness meet the general recording criteria or application of specific cases? So it's a general recording criteria we need to look at. If that's a yes, then we record the illness. What is this general recording criteria? Um, death, days away from work, job, uh, uh, restricted work or transfer to another job, or medical treatment. 
if an injury on the job causes a first three, it's pretty obvious that that happens, right? You know, if somebody dies, you know, if somebody doesn't come into work, you know, if somebody has light duty. Where we get a lot of the questions and confusion is what does OSHA consider medical treatment? We look at the definition from OSHA and they say a medical treatment includes the management and care of a patient for the purpose of combating disease or disorder. Thank you, OSHA. That's a really broad, broad statement that doesn't help me much to narrow this down. But what they do do is give us three exclusions that we can use to help us uh, uh, not track the ones that we don't need to track. The first is if you're just going to see a doctor or the hospital for observation only, that in and of itself is not recordable. So let's say one of your employees is working on a job site. It's a chemical factory. Um, you're working in the back of the building and there was a, a medical or a, a chemical spill. And part of the injury that could happen with that is over the next couple hours, uh, an injury you know, with the lungs could develop. So you send them to the hospital for observation to see if they get sick. Just them going to the hospital, even if they were admitted to the hospital, they're just there for observation, does not trigger an OSHA recordable. Second is diagnostic procedure. So just sending one of your employees to get an x-ray to see if they're injured in and of itself does not trigger an OSHA recordable. Keep that in mind, we get a lot of questions on that. And lastly, we have first aid cases. So if your employees get treated uh, on any one of these uh, cases, first aid um, care, doesn't matter who gives the care. It could be Dr. Oz for all I care. It could be John, it could be Scott could be me. It doesn't matter if um, they have these 14 things happen to them. Um, it is not a recordable on the OSHA log where maybe it might be turned into the workers comp. So that's another uh, you know, example where the, this stuff uh, may or may not overlap. So if an employee uh, gets prescribed non-prescription medication at non-prescription strength, that's a non-OSHA recordable. If they get to tetanus immunization, it's a non-OSHA recordable. Cleaning, flushing, or soaking wounds on the surface of the skin, that's a non-recordable. Using wound coverings such as bandages, gauze pads, or butterfly bandages, using hot or cold therapy, using any non-rigid means of support, such as elastic bandages, wraps, non-rigid back belts, drilling of a fingernail or toenail to relieve the pressure, or draining fluid from a blister, the use of eye patches, removing foreign bodies from the eye using only irrigation or cotton swab, Removing splinters or foreign material or areas other than the eye by irrigation. Users con swabs. I know I'm reading these fast. We have a list that we can share with you so you can refer back to. Um, the use of massage therapy, uh, drinking fluids for relief of heat stress, the use of finger guards, and using temporary immobilization devices while transporting an accident victim. So those 14, somebody has those, that is a non-OSHA recordable. You do not need to put that on the OSHA log. This year is the first year we have to deal with COVID-19 cases. Whether or not we need to put those cases on the log themselves. Back in May, uh, Federal OSHA gave us some direct guidance as to how to, how to track this. Uh, they gave us three criteria. The case must be a confirmed case of COVID-19. The case has got to be work-related. And the case has got to involve one of those general recording criteria. So the first part, uh, is a person, it's, they got to have a laboratory confirmation of COVID-19. It's not just, you know, I think I have COVID. It must be a laboratory confirmation of COVID-19. Where we get a lot of the questions and people working through it is to determine if that COVID-19 was work-related. You must ask the employee how they believe they contracted COVID-19 while you know, respecting their privacy, and then uh, review the employee's work environment for potential exposure. When there's no other explanation, a case is likely work-related. OSHA says when several cases develop among workers who work closely together, if it is contracted after lengthy close exposure to a customer or coworker who has a confirmed case of COVID-19, or if the employee's job duties include having frequent close exposure to the general public. That's what OSHA wants you to use to make the determination if COVID-19 is recordable on the OSHA law. So now that we looked at, do we need to keep OSHA records in the first place? Uh, are we setting up our locations properly? And are we keeping track of the right injuries on the form? We then get to this key part, the timeline that's right around the corner, is do we need to digitally submit our data to the federal government? And thank the government. They always love to make different you know, requirements, make it confusing for us. 
but the electronic submission requirements are separate and different from the record keeping requirements as a whole. So you may have to do the OSHA records and paper form that you've been doing for years. You may or may not have to do the, the digital submission. So this is the next layer of that compliance discussion. To digitally submit, you have to look at your industry. You, then you have to also look at the size of your individual establishment. Not the size of the company as a whole, as we looked at before, but the size of the individual establishment. For those establishments with over 250 employees, if you have to keep track of your logs already, you got to submit. So most of us on this line today, we're in the construction fields, you would have to submit. Where we get a lot of the people that, that uh, we help and we work through is this next group. If you have 20 to 249 employees in, at an establishment, at a location, and you're considered a high risk industry, which according to OSHA is construction, it's all construction, all manufacturing, a bunch of wholesale trade. It's actually 65% of all industries um, that fall into that category. You must also digitally submit. Um, and then if you have less than 20 employees at a particular location, uh, you may still have to keep the paper records as we talked about already, but you wouldn't have to digitally submit. What data are we submitting? It's basically that data on the OSHA 300A, your company information, your location information, and then all your injury statistics that we looked at in that form. So it's, it's so important to make sure you're keeping track of your logs properly by location. If you're not doing that, you can't digitally submit properly as well. March 2nd is a deadline to submit. We're sending the data from the OSHA 300A and employers must, um, you can set up a, an account at OSHA's website. You can type in 26 points of data by location. Um, so you're not just uploading the PDF of your 300A. Um, uh, you can do a CSV file. We're going to show you where you can actually use OSHA logs, um, our software to digitally submit directly to the federal government. We help you walk you through it. Think of it like the TurboTax of OSHA record keeping. And again, for being a member of ABC, there is no additional cost uh, to get a subscription to that platform, which we'll show you here in a minute. Just a comment because I love scaring people as well. The government loves to do that too. When you digitally submit to the federal government, you have to sign off and agree to the statement. Violations for material false, fictitious or fraudulent statements can be punished by a fine or by imprisonment of not more than five years or both. Do I believe anybody's going to jail for doing this wrong just yet? Probably not. And if you do go to jail, make up another story why you're in jail because you're not going to survive long if you say, I didn't do my OSHA records right. You know, you're not going to see jail. <laughs> you got to have a different story. But um, what's going to happen, you're creating a digital breadcrumb, you know, your digital trail of, of how well you're keeping track of this stuff. Let's say five years from now, you have a severe injury, knock on wood. And, uh, and then they're going to be able to, you know, do a little bit more investigation. And it's just another hammer they could potentially levy on you as an organization if they so desire. So make sure you take, uh, take it serious. Now you're setting that data up uh, uh, to the federal government. How's OSHA using the data? Of course, they want to look at this data for future legislation. Where are they going to put their legislative activity? They can target employers for worksite inspections based on your DART rate uh, by industry. Um, they're also planning on making this data a public for of the world to be able to search and see. Um, you can actually right now go in and search all the citations that OSHA levies against employers. They wanna make it easy to go look and search through this data as well. It's actually public already. It's just hard to find on their website uh, with the new Biden administration in place. It's one of the things that we fully anticipate um, companies to be able to look for. Why would they publicize that? If you look at the regulation when it was passed back in 2016, they say we, they want to use market forces to encourage safety within organizations. Companies want to protect the reputation. They want to be competitive with their competitors. They believe, you know, job seekers will want to, you know, work for safe companies. Investors will want to invest in safe companies. General contractors will want to work with safe employers. And of course, unions will be able to get access to the data and do what they do. Um, so just keep that in mind. So that's the important part where we want to make sure we're doing it right. We're not over-reporting as well. A couple more slides here. Um, 2021 and beyond. So we had this little thing called an election happen this past year. Um, and if you were uh, able to take a look at um, President Biden's uh, website, his campaign website, he talked about his vision for OSHA and workplace safety. Uh, they uh, they want to double the number of inspectors. 
We fully anticipate more data that will be required to submit to the federal government. Um, and I mentioned earlier to make this data public and easy to access. Um, there's also layers on top of this with the COVID-19 standard that we expect here soon as well. Um, so making sure we're reporting and tracking our COVID-19 incidents properly this year as well. So what should you do now? Well, now's the time to prepare your 2020 uh, records. If you haven't already, look for errors, look for mistakes, uh, finish your logs, avoid some common errors that we see. You know, if you're keeping these all lumped together, now's the time to separate them out properly. Um, make sure you have a company executive or officer certify the OSHA 300A. Many times we see um, a non-officer do that. And even if you have zero injuries, you still need to submit. If you meet those requirements, you still need to post your data. And for all of us as contractors in the construction trade, our DART rate is so important to us. Make sure if you have injuries and somebody is off of work the day of the injury and they come right back the following day, you don't have to count that injury as a days away case. I see that all the time. So keep that in mind. That will protect that DART rate score for you. Um, always go back, look at your past five years of OSHA logs data and OSHA inspector can ask for that. Make sure you hit your 2020 data, submit that up to the federal government. If you haven't already been accessed to OSHA logs from the folks at Sterling or from, you know, reaching us out on our website, it's kind of our first announcement that you get free access to OSHA logs. As I mentioned earlier, as being a part of, uh, the ABC the software guys designed to take the guesswork out of OSHA record keeping, make injury reporting a breeze for you. Everybody in the room or online can get access to this. You get a login, you can be able to track all your locations, track all your logs, you can add old log data. It's really simple whenever you have an injury or whenever you wanna track the injury, you go in, you add an injury in four minutes or less with our smart form. You can track your misses, you can track non-recordable. So it's really slick to use this as an injury management device works on all great mobile platforms. Um, it'll do all your OSHA records automatically for you. So everything in red is what you see on the form. We do automatically for you. The check marks, the numbers really simplifies that for you. It, you can also piggyback off that data to complete any stage workers comp form. So for us in Michigan, we have our form 100. It's half of the data that you've already filled out on the OSHA forms. We can piggyback off that and make it efficient and simple for you. Um, easy to change throughout the year, coming from one data source. So there's no mistakes between the forms. We have an entire team here at OSHA Logs that if you want help and you have a question about if something is recordable or not, we can, uh, we can help you work through that. And it's, it's another key benefit of OSHA Logs. All sorts of great injury statistics. And best of all, at the end of the year, when you need to do your digital submission, just like with TurboTax, our system will walk you through. We have a submission wizard super simple guide you through it our team is here to help you along the way so we're we're just really excited we partner with abc chapters around the country helping this we partner with a with an agent who uh who really has the same value system as us why does this matter why does this matter to dustin boss um we want companies to be proactive uh to use these osha records as the ultimate carry in the coal mine for potential injuries prevent serious injuries not just try to contain them when they happen. It's about saving lives. Every one of us on the line, we're part of a family. We work hard. We wanna go home to our family ha happy and healthy and safe each day. So if this is our little way, uh, Sterling Insurance and OSHA Logs to come back and work with your ABC chapter to give back. It's our way, our little way to help the business community. So please take advantage of that. That's my short portion of today's presentation. If you want access and you're online, you can email Scott. A McInerney at the Sterling Agency. If you're in person, I believe Scott has some forms you can fill out. Fill out what you can, and uh, and they can get you signed up um, in short order, uh, uh, and and you can use the platform. So again, no cost for doing that. Just a benefit of being part of the ABC. So I know I ripped through that, guys. Um, so if you have any questions, you can ask them. If we want to do that, I don't want to chunk into uh, the other parts of the presentation today. Otherwise, too, um, uh, Scott and I and the team, we can always work one-on-one -on -one with you guys if you have questions. So with that, John, I got through my section, and hopefully I didn't lose anybody along the way. Thanks, Dustin.
Yeah, thanks, Dustin. That's a slick program. Uh, you didn't mention, but there's other chapters around Michigan and the country that are already utilizing that. Um, and, and the reason we, we are working with them because at Sterling we are, uh, have a philosophy that we want to be proactive at managing risk, and that's one way to do it. You touched on the workers' compensation, so it's a good segue to briefly talk about the current uh, work count program here at ABC. Um, you have another PowerPoint. The PowerPoint on. Um, I'm sure a lot of you might be familiar, you know, as members or already um, have the, uh, the ABC Work Comp Self Insured Fund. Uh, I want to talk about it and point out a couple things that's a little bit different. Yeah, I don't think Keep it's going. sharing the screen for the other ones. What? I don't think it's sharing the screen for everybody else. Anyway, the, the work comp, uh, ABC work comp self-insured fund is different than a standard carrier where it's owned by the members. Uh, there's, I'll point out a few things um, where the, the members make the decision, it's owned by the members. And um, unlike a typical standard work comp carrier, you kind of control your money a little bit more. So, uh, and if there's at the end of the policy period, which is May 1st to May 1st, if there's any uh, money left over from claims or, or premium, it's paid back to the members, which I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. Because John works this out. Yeah, I'm trying to share. <laughs> Do you know how to share? Yeah, we have you back down to share screen button. But going back, to, uh, as I mentioned, being, being owned by the members, if for some reason there's a, a bad, bad year of claims and all the premiums get exhausted, you don't have to worry that you're going to be the ones that have to shell out a uh, premium out of pocket to pay the claims. There's, it's covered by an excess policy. So in other words, if, if, all, if all the premium gets exhausted and there's still claims out there to be paid, the excess policy will respond to those claims and not get paid out of pocket by the members. It's um, also got very competitive pricing you know, based on experience compared to to other standard carriers, it's you know roughly the same give or take a little bit. It all depends on each situation, but really where you're going to get advantage is being in the the program for you know two three years or so. You're going to see a lot of returns of the premium to come back, which shoot uh, I'll get to in the next slide in a second. But it's been uh, you know huge return premium for the members so far, which is probably why there's 98 percent uh, retention in that program. So it's graduated, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty, yeah. And in fact, three years, you're fully exactly. So it takes a couple of years to actually, you know, it's more of a long-term thing. It takes a couple of years to build that, but as we do, we start getting a lot more on the benefits. Right? The nice thing is, is as the claims are settled mm -hmm. and the money is released back to our members, uh, you can be getting dividends from two or three years. Uh, it, it can become pretty, pretty substantial. We've had years where people got 46 percent back on their premiums. Um, we are not, ABC is not uh, a workers' co company. We're not right. in it for no. the money. It's mm -hmm. a benefit we give our members. Right. So whatever money's left, we kick that back to them as a discount the next year once all the claims are settled. So um, I always tell people when you're looking at quotes, it's really not an apples to apples argument. It's apples and oranges. And quite honestly, our apples taste a lot better. Yeah, nine times out of 10 or more, it's yeah. going to be more competitive than you know, we, we represent over a dozen or 20 or so standard carriers, so it's not, I'm not trying to just push the fund because of that, because um, we're trying to rate that business, but it is a good program. They have a lot of good loss control mm -hmm. uh, in-house uh, design, and they you know, have a lot of experience with contractors, so, and a lot of training, too, that most of it comes at no cost, and they offer OSHA 10 and OSHA 30, but that's at a discounted price, so, but they do have those, those options for you, too. Mm -hmm. um, one reason we like it is because of that loss control. It, it kind of complements what we do at Sterling, because you know, we, we focus on uh, using our risk management strategies to help our clients you know, to improve the risk manage management by enhancing or implementing new policies and procedures that they don't have right now. Safety. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. We have a, we have a we call it a risk path process, yeah. where we really do a, take a deep dive, go back to the onion, and learn about our clients and, and where we can help. Um, if you could flick the, uh, go to the next screen, it just shows a little bit of historical data of um, how the, 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 the fund's been operating. As you can see there, 
there's been average estimated return of all the years, about roughly 45%, which is huge. And most recently, in the past five years, and I believe in 2020, wow. is it dead on 57%. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're going to really see big benefits. That, like you said, you kind of build it up. Yep. And then, you know, we, we had, it's not, not on the slides, but, you know, they'll, they'll take slash, you know, cut it off for premium. That's like a big down payment, pretty much so. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar with Work Comp, and if you're not familiar with the fund, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you want to reach out, whether it's the, uh, the, the Work Comp Fund, the ABC Workers' Compensation Self Insured Fund, or anything else we can help with. You know, we can yeah, definitely have, happy to help. But I didn't want to talk too much about the, the Work Comp, and um, you know, one thing we want to talk about today, and, and Brad is next here, is, is the, uh, the Health Trust Program that you guys have access to as well. Does yours start on a certain date or can you the work out? The work out. So you can start that at any time. Okay. It, it always renews on May first. So okay. if you happen, say we, you know, we just wrote it uh, with a new client mm -hmm. effective uh, February first. So that'll be a short term policy, right. and the, the premium will be prorated. So for you know three months of the year from right. mm -hmm. from uh, yeah, February first to, to May first, and yeah. it'll just renew on May first again. So okay, yeah, but that. Since it's only been three months, you won't see the returns right away on the first renewal. Right, so yeah, right, you said right. you can mm -hmm. climb that ladder, and you know you get, you get a lot of asset as you as you move forward. So it's, it's uh, you know I can send you some more information to on that. Like, and if it's any consolation, eighty percent of our contractors that are members at ABC of Southeast Michigan take advantage of our workers' count. And quite frankly, um, short of their companies closing their doors, they don't leave the fund. It, Right. It has been, it is the largest privately held workers' compensation fund in the state of Michigan, and quite frankly, one of the most successful workers' compensation funds. Um, I would say we're pretty frugal about how we manage it, and so we make sure that our members are taken care of first, and whatever's left over, like I said, we, we're very happy to kick that back and we yes. have a discount. Um, it, it, it makes being a member here, um, I guess that much sweeter if we can help them out with that part of their job and then also provide them some excellent benefits through our, our membership programs too. So, you know, yeah. so you get it as a discount the next year? It, well, it takes a year or two it, to build up. As I understand that part of it, but yep. I'm saying it. The, yep. the way you show that that, yep. that yep. money back is your, a discount off of your premium. Yep. 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 It'll be all laid out there, so it's yeah. yeah. That's why I always tell people when you look at a uh, Oh, especially if it's uh, another company, uh, you're going to be like, oh, well, you know, ABC seems a little bit higher. Um, you know, that that's because it's, it's a very substantially different kind of AB or workers comp fund. Um, you know, you can expect it, it historically. I'm trying to think how long the fund's been in existence, but oh, right, right, you're talking right. decades. Yeah. I mean, each at 91. So yeah, so it's been. And, and been a very well managed fund, and we have a board of directors that oversee it for the entire state. So we're not just Southeast Michigan, we work with Greater Michigan Chapter and Western Michigan Chapter to offset all of our costs for our members. And so it's, you know, knock on wood so far, it's been a really tremendous benefit for a lot of our guys. Even though John said he could see it up front. Initially, it might look a little higher, and it's not not extremely, it it's not, not double or anything. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes it's a little less. So yeah. it happens, it's case by case basis. So, yeah. but yeah, as you move forward, it's going to be you know five years from that point. It's going to be a lot less than uh, any other carrier would be. Okay. I'll turn it over to uh, Brad Richards now. He's from Sterling Insurance as well. We'll talk a little bit about the builders uh, health trust program. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Richards. Uh, great to be here today and to talk about health insurance, right? Uh, th this is a, such a confusing topic, and, and first and foremost, that we, we really want to be an advocate for all of you because this is not what you do every day. There's a lot of wiggles. There's a lot of ways to, uh, to do things differently, and this is something that's unique to ABC specifically is this trust program, uh, and it's knowing to take advantage of it. So with the trust, it's, it's exclusive rates with Priority Health and with McLaren. So even if you're with one of the two of them today, this is a different offering than what you would get directly from them. So it could make sense to take a look at this. You can join it at any time. The renewal is, is the same for everybody though. It goes from 4-1 through 3-30 the next year. 
So right now is that pivotal time that if you're going to explore it, to take advantage of a full 12 months of rates because everyone renews for one later. So there's a couple of basics with this program. With, with the trust itself, you do need five enrolled in the plan. So if you're, if you're below five, it's not going to make sense. If you're above, absolutely. Um, comes down to the differences. So for those of us that, that have less than 50 employees on your health plan, you could be looking at age banded rates. When you're looking at the rates, it's going to show from 18 to 29. Everybody's got a different rate. So a lot of smaller employers that we talk to, under 50, they like composite rates. And that's what happens with the fund. So what we mean by composite rates is a single is a single. Whether you're 18 or 70, it's that same flat amount. So from, from a, a bookkeeping standpoint, uh, from, from cost sharing to what are you passing off charges to the employees, are they sharing in that? It makes it easier to calculate. So some smaller employers that have gotten into the fund, they absolutely love this difference of having a true composite rate. Because when you're looking at, I'm going to share 50% of costs, or, or the employees are going to share 30% of the costs, when you're calculating 30% of the costs for a 60-year-old versus a 24-year-old, that you can really create some tension inside your workforce because everyone's talking and they're saying, holy cow, I'm paying X. So it is different. Um, so that's a huge move that you would become a large group because you're a part of the trust itself. You know, you're, it's not just you on your, your own as 10 employees that you are now at this point a part of a large employer. One of the nice things about this is if you ever switch to health plan, it can be tedious. There's a lot of things that go on. That's why I have so many gray hairs of my age. I'm getting too old. I can't use that joke anymore. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I was really gray early. Um, <laughs> But minimal paperwork, so if it makes sense for you to, to do this, it is very, very simple. It's not this huge rigmarole that it's employee applications, it's a simple employer form, it's not all the tax statements and ownership and K-1s, et cetera. And most importantly, there's no medical underwriting. So the rates are the rates are the rates. We don't care what your average age is. We don't care who's smoker, non-smoker, what medications they're taking, et cetera. It's a flat rate. So is that priority health? You get a PPO come through there, or whatever you want. The different tiers. Same yeah. as. Yeah, we'll we'll go. We'll look, I'll just show you the menu. There's a huge selection that you can pick. And you said up. it's through McLaren only. It's priority and McLaren. So depending upon where you're located. So part of the investigation that we would do on behalf of, of any employer interested is look at where are your employees, where's the business located, and then priority is going to make sense for all of Michigan. But McLaren has a subset that, depending upon where you're at, where the employees are at, that we could also consider McLaren as well. Just to be upfront, priority has been more attractive uh, from what we're seeing, but we still want to look at all options. You know, that's really what I feel like is we're more of a detective. What are we trying to do? You know, what are the main, the main goals and, and problems that we're running into? John, if you can hit that next slide. So this is the menu that we look at and, and it's not what we do on your behalf is gather information so we would look at if you had a plan in place today all I would need is an invoice and a benefit summary of what you're offering and I can go through and look at what is the closest comparable plan and compare those rates and if you are age banded, we would calculate all that to see how you would shake out one versus another. So there's PPO plans, there's HMO plans, there's HSA plans. I don't know, do you guys, would you like me to go through the differences between those? Yeah, can you, if you have an HSA now, can you transfer it to this one? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So with an HSA account, that, that's where you have a banking option that you can put pre-tax funds. They're great programs. Um, you can transfer that balance from one provider to another. So most of, most popular is the PPOs, and then you'll you'll see that there are HSA options for both PPO and HMOs. Another option that you have is, as a smaller employer, you you might 
limit yourself purposely to one plan. This is easier to administer, right? Well, with this, you can pick multiple plan options. Now, I would still encourage, you know, should we offer all six? No, because it's almost like having 200 funds inside of a 401k. You don't even know where to start at that point. So it's really putting our heads together and say, okay, the PPO $1,500 deductible is closest to what we have today, but I want to offer an even lower cost option and let's implement this HSA as a, as a secondary option and just to kind of create some differences because the workforce comes in. We know what's happening already. People are working later in life. And those that are, that are a higher average age might be a little uncomfortable with the concept of an HSA to start because we've already have some conditions coming in. So we're going to have this plan for them. But for our younger staff or those that are not incurring much uh, uh, medical expenses, they can jump right into that HSA. And where we start to get creative is what's the cost difference between these two plans? And based on what you're contributing as the employer, to this, it might make sense that there's enough savings that we can actually put a small portion into the HSA account for the employee as the employer. And that's where it really gets fun. You can click the next one. Yeah. So part of that's really what we do, and, and that's our, our whole message today with the benefits is you don't have to do any of that work. If this is something that you want to check out, we can, we can look at a lot of these. But it might make sense, you know, the, the trust plan with priority and with McLaren is not a one size fits all. Depending upon the average age of the group, you could be best off on your own. So again, at the same time, we can look at what does Blue Cross look like on a standalone basis, priority, uh, uh, United Healthcare, all of these different vendors that if the trust doesn't make sense, we can still act on your behalf and do that complete investigation for you. Then we can also look at what, what else is out there. We, we had a, a meeting yesterday with a, with a new uh, employer, and I love uh, you know, what's on that wish list. I want to know what's on that wish list. What do you wish you could make go away? What do you wish you could have that you don't have today? And some things came out, and one of the, one of the items was, I have a significant portion of part-time staff and the turnover is, is there. What about offering, you know, what can I do to help firm this up? And so you can do voluntary dental, voluntary vision, uh, voluntary life insurance. We even have an employer that pays for a small portion of life insurance for all of their part-timers if they work at least 20 hours, 20 to 29.999. They're getting 10,000 of life insurance just for being an employee there, because this market right now that we're in, it's hard to find people. Oh, yeah. It's hard to find bad people, let alone good people. <laughs> so anything that we can do to try to firm it up, you know, be creative. So those hours, are those your stipulations, or is that the employer's? That's the employer's. Okay, effect. so they, you can set them at anything. Yeah, you know, okay. it's, so what we would work with is, is the, the underwriter and say, Here's what we have. We have, uh, and that was a hospitality. That was a, a large hotel. Mm -hmm. And it makes perfect sense for them because they have a significant part-time staff. But you could even say, I, I want to do 15 hours, whatever that is, that we can go back to the underwriter and make that rule. And then we're setting up those guidelines just to make sure that the employer is not discriminating, that it's equal for everybody with those same rules. Right. Right. So you can do that with a number of things, life insurance, disability, dental, vision. Um, there's a lot of different factors that start to feed in and, and make you different from other employers. So you don't have an employee that is leaving for 50 cents an hour to go to another job that they're saying, I might be making a little bit more, but I'm losing all of these other benefits that are behind the scenes. So we get very creative. I love this part of it. Um, and then it's all the back-end support. No matter what you choose, if it's the ABC Trust that makes sense, if it's a standalone policy directly with Blue Cross or directly with Priority, that we start to come in behind. And that is truly the only difference that we have uh, as agents, that we all represent the, the, the same 
products for the same price, which is very unique in and of itself. The trust is different. That is only available as members. But when we go out to the rest of the market with the Delta Dentals, et cetera, it's, it's all the same, except for the back end support. So we do a lot of different things in terms of administrative support. I've been in this industry over 20 years. Um, and we have something that's very, very unique that it's called an applicant. And we have two that sit in our Sterling Heights office. When you have an employee that says, I've got a claim that wasn't paid, I don't think it was paid right. Uh, I'm having trouble getting a prior authorization on a drug. I need to get a surgery and I don't know where to, to go. I'm having problems. That they can call our advocates. They are our employees on site and they walk them through that process. And in terms of, of the problems that come up during that, you know, it's, there's a lot of frustration. We pay a lot of money for this stuff. We want it to work properly. And they are specialists in regards to that. So all the employees have access right to the advocacy team. And then in compliance, I was in a call just prior to this meeting that we discovered that the employer was wildly out of compliance, didn't know any better, has the best intentions. They are acting as an employer of good faith, but doesn't understand all of the checks and balances. You know, their, their business is educating students. You know, your business is, is building, you know, doing some different areas of construction. We don't have time to focus on some of these compliances. So as we meet and start this investigation, we'll go through some different things. What we find, we analyze, we attack, we put it to sleep, and, and get it out of the way so it's not a liability on your behalf. So there's a lot of different things that we do, value adds. Um, we we uh, have another service that's called Sterling HR, and employers and, and HR uh, staff love this. So if you've got those questions, you have a, 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 an ask an expert, if you will. There's a Google bar, and uh, we've gotten some wild ones recently. So uh, human resource says, I think I have an employee that is high in the job, what do I do? And instead of guessing or doing something wrong, they can put that into the Google bar and in very quick, short order, they're getting a response back with template language, here's how to document this problem, here's how to, to address it. Instead of going off the handle and, and regretting or not doing it, documenting it properly, um, it gives you that good backup. And um, that could be a legal question, a tax question, a benefits question, hiring, firing, retention, corrupt question. So we provide that at no cost to all of our uh, employer partners uh, as, as an avenue. There's also an 800 number too. You can call yeah. and talk to a live person. Yeah. Perfect. So the options are endless. If you have something that's in place today, it's as simple as sending over uh, an invoice of your coverage along with a summary. And then we can take a look at it and analyze it, take the next steps. If you have no plan in place, this is the perfect time to start because you're right at the start of that trust. And getting started is easily the hardest part if you don't offer it because you don't know what do I budget, what do the employees contribute. That that's we can really help in regards to that and building a plan. So between Scott and I. Uh, I'm strictly on the benefits side, uh, and, and Scott is, is representing the commercial. Um, we are happy to help you in any way possible and, and take those next steps or just start a conversation. So, is there any questions? Awesome. Thank you for the time and the invite. Yeah. And just uh, for the record, uh, we've had a, a very good relationship with Sterling. They're not a new member. They're a member we've worked with for quite a few years. Um, and, and have found them to be very reliable um, and straight shooters. So quite frankly, um, they're, they're not ones to try and decorate the car with a lot of options if you don't need them. So they will tell you what they think is going to be best for your company and will work for you on a long-term basis. So feel confident in reaching out and, and having that conversation with them. Um, and thanks, Brad, uh, and Dustin. I don't know if he's still on, but thank you. Um, we appreciate you guys being here. Uh, I, I, we're going to try and, and get back to doing more in-person events where we can, uh, you know, network and talk to one another on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, in the interim, though, we're going to keep having these smaller, more intimate events. Uh, this is the first Lunch and Learn of the year. We're going to look to have probably five more of these at least throughout the year. 
We're also going to be having a legal series to talk about some of the changing politics and how we could better protect our companies moving forward with changes in regulation. So stay tuned. We will try to reach out to you guys on a regular basis to make sure you're the most well-informed association member we got. So thanks again for being here and, and, and help yourself to some more food. Please be safe uh, driving home too. We, uh, we know it's snowing out there. So, uh, And all those folks who joined us online, we will be reaching out to you and sending you uh, all the information that we discussed uh, in person. So you'll get a hard copy uh, mailed to you, an electronic copy emailed to you as well. Uh, thank you for being here. If you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to either myself or Greg Tankersley. Uh, we're more than happy to serve you guys and get any questions answered that you might have. So thank you so much. Uh, be safe out there and, and have a great rest of the week.